Hi, this is Charles Hoskinson, Chief Executive Officer of Input Output, and I've decided to make a video explaining what is Bitcoin and what is the point of the blockchain industry. Uh, this video is inspired by uh, J.K. Rowling's recent tweet where she asked for the industry to explain to her why should we care about Bitcoin? What's the point of it? What's the purpose of it? Is it real? Is it not real? Uh, so that was her call to action and I've answered that call to action and I've decided to make a video. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the $64,000 question. What is Bitcoin? I started in this industry in late 2010, early 2011 uh, as an investor and a miner. Uh, and then uh, professionally, I quit everything else I was doing in life in 2013 and actually entered the space as a full-time vocation. So I've been in the cryptocurrency space now for about seven years and I founded many projects in the space, but I started with Bitcoin and I started with something called the Bitcoin Education Project. And the goal there was to try to bring as many people as possible into our ecosystem uh, and to also dispel a lot of the common myths, uh, fear, uncertainty, disinformation and misnomers and things that had been cropping up. And in 2013, there's certainly a lot of them. And unfortunately, today, there's even more. The reality is, despite the fact that Bitcoin is pervasive with millions of people in our ecosystem and uh, mainstream knowledge of it, very few people actually understand what Bitcoin actually is, its point where it came from, why it was created, and where this industry is going, why we exist. What's the relationship, for example, between Bitcoin and blockchain? This is something that not many people in the mainstream public understand. So the purpose of this video is to start from first principles and kind of work our way up to what is Bitcoin and then explore a little bit about what the blockchain industry is as a whole and why it's such an exciting industry and why I've chosen to spend seven years of my life in this industry. And my hope is that many other of the leaders in my industry can also make explainer videos to explain why they entered and what they feel is so special about the things that they do, as well as giving a shot at defining Bitcoin. So let's start from the very beginning. In 2009, Bitcoin was created. And Bitcoin was created uh, by an unknown person or persons uh, referred to as Satoshi Nakamoto. Basically, this was a pseudonym uh, and the creator remained anonymous. In fact, uh, the anonymity of the creator is so strong that even after the email account that the creator used was compromised and the emails revealed to the general public, uh, no one has since been able in the 11 years to discern who Satoshi Nakamoto actually is. Uh, so true to form, uh, Bitcoin has always had a bit of mystery from the very beginning. Uh, but really what the point of Bitcoin was, was to be an experiment. And basically it's an experiment with frustration and passion. So the passion component The passion component of Bitcoin was really about an exploration of what is money and can we create better money? It's important to understand the context of where Bitcoin came from. If we look at 2009, this was right on the back of the 2008 financial crisis, which was the worst financial crisis for the world since the Great Depression. And as a consequence, people were starting to go back to first principles and ask fundamental questions of, well, are our central banks creating good money? What makes good money? Can we create better money? Does money need to be controlled by centralized power? Do we need banks or can you be your own bank? Uh, what is the influence of the internet on money? Uh, these types of questions. And so if we deconstruct money, much the same way that Satoshi Nakamoto did, and the people in our industry did, we can look at a, a very nice economic definition that's existed in pretty much every 101 textbook. And we see that there are three properties that money has. One, it's a unit of account. Two, it's a means of exchange. And then three, it's a store of value. It's kind of a funny thing that most of us spend 
at least 40 hours a week working, making money. Uh, we have jobs, uh, we chase it. A lot of people dream of becoming millionaires, but then when you try to actually deconstruct what are those silly pieces of paper that are in your pocket? What are those numbers in your bank ledger when you log into your uh, Chase app or your Wells Fargo app or whatever it might be? Uh, you get your ATM receipt. Nobody really seems to think too much about, well, what are these things? What do they mean? Why do we use them? So let's explore this a little bit, and then hopefully we can kind of build our way up to where Bitcoin came from, the passion side of things. And then we can perhaps learn a little bit more about the frustration side of things. So first off, a unit of account, what does that mean? Well, it's so ingrained into our culture now that we tend to miss this, but what if we didn't actually have the ability to measure prices in a dollar or a euro or a pound sterling? So what if instead of saying, well, my services will be $30, or instead of saying that that uh, couch is $300, uh, we had a non-standard unit of account. So every time you went to a different store, they'd actually charge different prices for different things. Like, oh, I need some uh, 45 packs of green tea for this, and that over there, uh, I'd like a 50-pound bag of sand. Uh, it would be pretty chaotic, and it would actually be difficult to have price discovery. You would never really know uh, if something was expensive or cheap everything would be relative and it would almost be like a barter system. So the point of a unit of account is this concept of standardization. This gives you a sense of understanding how expensive things are, how cheap things are relative to some standard that you understand, that you know, that you are familiar with. You have a relative sense of whether a million dollars is a lot of money or a little bit of money relative to the things that you can buy and trade with it and other properties. Means of exchange is just that. You have two or more parties. They want to conduct commercial activity with each other. They have something, whether it be a product or service, that you want, and you're trying to acquire it from them. So basically, money is that middleman that allows you to efficiently exchange that value with your counterparty. And then finally, a store of value is this concept that when you get this money, it doesn't magically deteriorate, doesn't disappear uh, so as soon as uh, you put it in your pocket, it, it um, uh, evaporates in 24 hours or something like that, or spoils or rots. For example, could you imagine using food as money? Uh, you might be able to standardize it. You might be able to actually use it for commerce, and people certainly value it. But food does tend to rot over time, especially things like fruit or other uh, uh, commodities like that. So store value is this concept of the durability of value over a period of time. And does it hold it? Does it lose it? So these are the three fundamental properties that anything that aspires to be money must have. And every sovereign currency, whether it be the US dollar or the yen or some other currency, has these properties, uh, at least arguably has these properties. And for the most part, they allow a sustainable, stable economy to form. Then there are kind of level two stuff. So these are those are the fundamental things. So you can say level one, the most foundational principles. And these are things that go into the quality. So the quality side of things are things like, is it easy to move and transport? It's kind of a silly concept, but imagine gold as money. Well, if you had gold as money, very heavy, it's very difficult to move around. It's difficult to store. Uh, it uh, invites certainly people uh, trying to rob you, and these types of things. So the transportability of money is super important, especially when you talk about large transactions across borders. Could you imagine a system where people had to pay in gold for things that were occurring across the sea? So for example, a purchase from the United States to the European Union, uh, let's say Germany and you had to mail the gold to the person and wait for it to arrive. So transport is you know, certainly a hugely important component. Durability is another. Good money should be somewhat durable. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you have paper money, uh, but that paper money is poorly printed, and over time it tends to wear down very quickly uh, to the extent that the bills are actually destroyed. You consider that not to be a very good money. 
uh, or what if your money rots or uh, has other properties that make it deteriorate quickly. So we'd like money to be durable, and this is why uh, most monetary systems started with coinage, uh, building things from metal. In fact, metal is so durable, I, I personally have coins that were issued during the Roman Empire. They're still around, so it gives you a sense that you can have high durability over a long period of time. Uh, there's also things like fungibility. And this is probably one of those terms that you've never heard before, or you can't remember the definition of it, but it's a pretty simple idea. Uh, basically, you cannot distinguish, or you don't really care to distinguish between two units of the currency. Uh, so uh, if I have a coin and you have a coin and they both say a dollar on them, you don't particularly care or hold one in higher esteem. Uh, this is not true for all things. Uh, there are certainly cases like, for example, um, coinage that's been uh, improperly minted and it's a collector's item, uh, or perhaps uh, maybe your coin belonged to somebody special. But in general, fungibility is an extremely important component of money uh, because you don't want the money itself to get in the way of commerce, the means of exchange, unit of account. You want each unit to be identical uh, from the other units. And this is certainly true with digital monies. Uh, the digital dollar that lives on PayPal uh, is indistinguishable from the digital dollar that lives in your JP Morgan Chase account or something like that. Okay, so we have the ability to transport, the durability of the asset, the fungibility, and can you divide it? So divisibility is a very important property as well. Um, imagine going to a swap meet or a garage sale and you only have a $20 bill and the uh, person at the garage sale doesn't have change. How would you actually conduct commerce and you want to buy something that's $11? Uh, so you have to kind of figure this out. And so divisibility is one of those things of can uh, we break it into sufficiently small pieces so that we can get very specific about the pricing of items. Uh, so certain currencies uh, enable this quite well, especially digital currencies. Uh, other currencies, you're at the mercy of both parties of, you know, how do you break this down? And in fact, um, some currencies are losing some divisibility. There's been many discussions throughout the years, for example, of getting rid of the penny, uh, which is a fundamental unit of account. So these are some of the properties that go into the quality of money, uh, the ability to transport it, the durability, the fungibility of it, the divisibility of it, and then you can even go even further and you can talk about uh, concepts like inflation, deflation. You can talk about concepts like credit and debt. And they're all interconnected with each other. Uh, and ideas about supply. So even today, despite the fact that it's 2020, there are still some definitional issues when you look at these things about uh, what is actually the true definition of inflation or deflation. There's an Austrian definition, a classical economic definition, and then credit and debt are kind of interesting concepts unto themselves. So as you go up levels, you kind of start with some fundamental ideas and properties of unit of account, means of exchange, and store of value. And then you say, well, there's some things that we'd like our money to have to be high quality. And then if we have high quality money that has great properties, then we have to kind of look at the long-term viability of it. And we have to look at um, our confidence in its ability to sustain an actual economy. Uh, for all of modern economies to run, you actually need credit and debt, and for all modern economies to run, you need to be able to understand the value of money over time, or else people will not have faith and confidence in it. So this is basic monetary policy 101. And what Satoshi did with his experiment of passion was say, okay, I'm gonna take a very particular set of opinions about all of these things, and this overall goal of these opinions is decentralization. That's the key word. And decentralization from the perspective of when we actually try to make these systems work in practice. So let's say we have Alice and we have Bob. And Alice and Bob actually wanna do commerce with each other. They wanna actually trade and exchange with each other. 
When they actually want to do that, they have to usually do it through some form of middleman. Okay, and generally speaking, many middlemen. So let's say that Bob runs a coffee shop and Alice is buying coffee and she uses a Visa or a MasterCard to purchase that coffee. There's actually multiple middlemen, multiple networks, multiple protocols that stand between Alice and Bob before final settlement occurs. So even though Alice has a quick and easy payment experience, to actually get that value over to Bob is a very complex, heavily regulated, very expensive, and not super inclusive process. In fact, that process is so not inclusive, about 3 billion people throughout the world lack sufficient financial access to have real economic identity. And so we tend to term them as unbanked. The concept of decentralization is saying, can Alice and Bob have the same kind of relationship that they would have with cash, but do this over the internet? And this is a major, major, major question because with cash, you'll notice something. Uh, it does not require a central authority. It does not require middlemen. You can just simply directly hand somebody a $20 bill. Uh, you can directly hand somebody a bag full of quarters uh, and then purchase something with that and they hand you the product or service, okay? Uh, now, that money does have some sort of uh, metadata behind it has some sort of infrastructure behind it like nobody would just accept a piece of paper it has to say something like a Federal Reserve note or issued by the Bank of England and so you trust the credibility of that so there was really two steps to this process one is how do you build an online money that doesn't require central authority okay no central authority and online, and how do you get people to actually have faith in this currency? And these are two completely different things. It's one thing to construct a transaction system where Alice can do business with Bob. It's another thing entirely to construct a transaction system where Bob, when he receives that unit that you've created, that Bitcoin or whatever you want to call it, that digital token, actually believes it's worth something. It's worth uh, his time. It's worth his products and services. So this was, in essence, the experiment of Bitcoin. Can we create an online currency? Can we create some sort of online unit of account, some sort of online proto money, if you will, that has a lot of really cool properties about it, uh, that replicates the utility and function of cash, but does not require a central issuer, a central bank, like the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England, uh, yet still people would accept it for products and services. Bob would actually want to use that money. Uh, this was a hell of an experiment to conduct. It required the invention of a lot of really unique technology. Uh, for example, proof of work and blockchain and very clever application of cryptography. Uh, but at its core, it was an experiment of passion and frustration. The passion was, can we create this new type of money that follows the concept of decentralization? It allows Alice and Bob to have a direct relationship with each other. Uh, we get rid of any central authority. It's online by default, and somehow it's built in a way that people have enough faith in it that it's gonna be around, it's gonna work, it can't be hacked, and it doesn't require a central authority to give it credibility. The frustration component was that the money systems that we have today are not working so well for us. Uh, historically, all fiat currencies tend to eventually deteriorate and collapse because of uh, the political and moral temptations to debase them for short-term gains at the expense of long-term gains. Uh, for example, the countries of Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, uh, the Warmark Republic in Germany. Uh, there are many cases of hyperinflation. There was one in Hungary. Uh, throughout the years and many people are a bit concerned about the massive monetary expansions we've seen over the last 15 years in particular as a direct consequence of the 2008 financial crisis and the most recent the covid funding that's occurred six trillion dollars perhaps now nine trillion in the united states and certainly more throughout the rest of the world so the frustration was saying 
can we remove people from this process so that we can have a bit more objective predictability? And the objective predictability is basically saying that we know the supply ahead of time uh, and we know by which rules the supply is going to change. So we understand this monetary policy. We understand that there's not going to be dramatic changes to the qualitative aspects of the system. We understand what the terms and conditions are up front. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no hidden end user license agreement. There's no bureaucrat that can wake up on the wrong side of the bed on Tuesday and then suddenly say we're going to massively increase the supply or we're going to do it to help me win an election or something like that. So that was the frustration component, and certainly many of us live in that, um, in that world. So that, in essence, is where Bitcoin began. It began in 2009. There's kind of this idea of money, and it said, hey, let's have some passion about it, and that passion's going to have a philosophy behind it of decentralize everything we can, and by decentralization, we mean that people can individually do business with each other without any middlemen required, and they can do that natively online, no central authorities required for those transactions to work, and they're gonna have so much faith in it that the system will be self-sustaining, so sustainable, and also valuable. Those two properties, sustainable and valuable. And the beautiful thing is that since 2009 to 2020, mission accomplished. Not only has Bitcoin grown from a very small network that was unstable and unsustainable, uh, it has grown to a point where uh, it has become a global scale network worth over a hundred billion dollars and you can literally buy pretty much anything you want and get any service you want using a Bitcoin. Uh, it's a truly extraordinary experiment from that particular perspective and uh, we all in this industry are frankly in awe of just the durability, the resilience and uh, the remarkable growth of the underlying technology. There are very few examples in human history where something has gone from a small group of people uh, to over millions and millions of users in every country in the world uh, and had such a pervasive impact on law and regulation and innovation of an industry as Bitcoin. It's actually outpaced the growth of the internet by a large factor. Uh, so mission accomplished definitely as an experiment. Now, the heart of Bitcoin what makes Bitcoin work is really this idea of a blockchain. So the problem is that if you're going to create a digital token, you have to have a ledger somewhere. And that ledger is basically just kind of a database. And it's a very special kind of database. It stores history. So it's a database of facts. stores history. And what type of history does it store? It stores transactions. So ordinarily, when you have Alice and Bob, and they want to do business with each other online, they're going to use an intermediary like PayPal or something like that. And there's a lot of things that go into this transaction before it even happens. Alice has to prove that she actually has that money she claims that she wants to pay Bob with. And there has to be some sort of address, some sort of way of sending that value to Bob. Okay, so the whole point of middlemen like PayPal or other payment processors, money service businesses, is to basically act as a proxy to sort all of that stuff out. But the minute that you get rid of them, you remove them from this process, you're kind of left with this issue of, well, how does Alice prove that she has the money that she claims, and how does she actually send it to Bob, and then how does Bob know 
when he's actually received it, when it's actually in his account. It can't be taken back from him, these types of things. So where does Bob go and who does he trust? And that was a tremendously difficult problem. And this is at the core innovation of Bitcoin was to build a system in 2009, uh, basically a blockchain to solve this problem. So succinctly a blockchain is just simply a ledger and it stores transactions. And those transactions allow you to verify, anyone to verify, Bob or anyone else, claims such as, I have this many units of Bitcoin, uh, so I have two Bitcoin, for example. If I say that, Bob can actually check that. This is a property called inclusive accountability. Basically, we can all check each other's homework. Uh, we can all see the record. So what happens is that there's this database in the sky, in the cloud, and Bob can look at it, and if Alice is trying to send a transaction to him, uh, he's actually able to say, yes, that's actually two Bitcoin. It exists. There you go. And then he's able to confirm that when she initiated that transaction, the network itself received it, processed it, and he actually has it. Uh, so how that's done it uses something called cryptography. It uses a mechanism of consensus called proof of work and a litany of other complex things. And they're beyond the scope of this introductory lecture. But basically, math and computer science is used to create some sort of database in the sky, the ledger, and we call that database a blockchain because once a record has been written, it's a fact. Just like George Washington was president, you can never change that. No matter how much you'd want to or, or desire to, it's just something that happened. It's a record of history. So it's a very particular type of blockchain, uh, of database that is immutable, meaning you cannot change records inside of it. And because it has this property called inclusive accountability, it means that anyone in the world can actually verify that these transactions and these records happen. Uh, if you assert you have something and you try to spend it, everybody in the world who has this protocol can run it, check it, and that math and crypto actually allows you to verify that it's right. Uh, this was a revolutionary concept because every attempt to do this previously required some trusted third party to maintain the ledger. Bitcoin was the first example of something that was released that did not require a trusted third party. The network by its very mere operation would be able to simulate that. And of course, the minute that you create something very innovative and revolutionary, it inspires people to dream and say, hang on a second here, the world is just not financial transactions. And this leads us to the second part of the lecture, the blockchain industry. They say, hang on a second here, there are all kinds of things in the world that we are trusting third parties to do that we really would not want to. For example, voting. I would love every time I vote to be able to verify that my vote first was counted and second that my vote was accurately counted. So I'd love to be able to know that I, when I have the right to vote, it's been properly recorded and my vote has been recorded and know that for a fact for every other person. I don't want to trust a third party to go count those votes for me. I don't want to trust a third party to handle that system for me because it's a vector of attack. And if we're making life and death decisions and deciding who gets to be president and how the economy is going to run, we have to have a lot of confidence and faith in voting. So voting is another example of a system that you could do differently. Property is another example of a system you could do differently. So currently, property is managed by some form of registry. So if you have a title or you have land, somebody has to keep that database. But what happens if somebody can manipulate or edit that database? Or what happens if the government changes? Like when ISIS took over Syria, then they can go and just decide to change history 
And then it becomes very difficult after things uh, get back to normal to decide who actually owned what where, what was the versions of history. And in many cases, because it's too expensive to maintain these systems, millions of people throughout the world live on undeeded land. Uh, what about different types of financial products? So Bitcoin was focused on money and it was focused on what is good money. And it's still a big debate of whether Bitcoin is good money or not. And it's a good debate of what is money in general, but it was very clearly trying to be one thing. But we have other things like, for example, Microsoft stock, uh, debt instruments like bonds, representations of things, for example, uh, tokens representing gold or a commodity like oil. So are there different ways that we can represent these using the same systems that Bitcoin uses to represent a Bitcoin? and not require trusted third parties to manage these systems? And the answer is yes. So a lot of people are looking at that. Supply chains are another great example of this. So in supply chains, for example, right now we have a pandemic. Uh, what about global supply chains for personal protective equipment or vaccines or medicine? Uh, you have so many different actors touching things, many claims about things, and people are making life and death decisions based upon the stability of these supply chains and the fidelity of the information in them. So it turns out that blockchain technology is actually quite good for this uh, because you don't have to trust a central authority or a trusted third party or federation of third parties to make sure that the records are accurate. You can do it in a completely decentralized way in many cases. Identity itself is another example of that. That's one of your most important assets. You have a passport and a driver's license, a birth certificate, a credit score, uh, these types of things. So who are you in statements and claims about your reputation? Uh, this is increasingly linked also with personally identifiable information. So your data that Facebook and Google and other people mine how do you manage identity? And right now, it's given to you by trusted third parties. You're issued a passport. You're issued a driver's license. You're issued uh, some form of an identity asset uh, through a private entity or a government entity. And uh, then statements and claims are made about that identity, again, by credit agencies and perhaps governments with social credit, for example. Uh, you don't actually own that, and you're not in control of that and your identity is managed a lot by middlemen and third parties who at any time can manipulate the records against your best interest if it's in their best interest. So the whole point of the blockchain industry is to take a look at that same core principle of decentralization, getting rid of middlemen. The key word is disintermediation. and introducing inclusive accountability to all of these uh, different topics. So basically the idea is that uh, you can check that the integrity of the records in these systems are as accurate as uh, people assert them to be. And you know that no one's tampered with the records. They're timestamped, they're immutable, they're auditable, and these are super important properties. And there's dozens of others. So like all great experiments, Bitcoin basically launched an entire movement of millions of people. And in just a very short period of time, from 2009 to 2020, uh, we have seen a global conversation about what makes good money and our private money is possible. Uh, and then the underlying heart of the system inspired many technologists and entrepreneurs to launch a new industry called the blockchain industry and to start constructing all kinds of protocols and cool new ideas to revolutionize the way that society and commerce works. So in many ways, this is one of the most significant human experiments ever conducted because as we enter the 21st century, it's becoming increasingly clear that globalization is going to fundamentally change how the entire world operates. We're moving from nation states, we're moving from siloed economies into economies that are deeply interconnected and intrinsically transnational. In many ways, our laws, how we live, how we trade, how we think, are as interconnected to the affairs of other states as they are to our own backyard. Uh, so uh, just the product labels, the packaging, uh, what goes into your food, could ultimately be determined by transnational agreements 
uh, by, uh, by other people in countries you've never been to or met. And so given that we live in a world like that, there's this really hard meta question to answer, which is who is in charge? And as we go through the 21st century, it's not really clear how to answer that question. Historically, how we've answered that question is through might. Might makes right. Uh, an empire will form, subjugate all others, and then the empire will standardize everything. And then we just follow it by convention and consensus, and then that's that. But as we move to a global world where we don't really want to have a world war and centralize power around one authority, we're trying to manage for the first time in human history, a way of doing this without might, a way of doing this through diplomacy and reason and trade. And the problem is that this is an inexact science and unfortunately uh, the better angels of our nature sometimes get consumed by the worst angels, the worst demons of our nature. Um, the entire point of the blockchain industry is basically trust regulation. The idea that people have to work together who don't really trust each other, but they have to find a way to do so for a common good, to solve a common problem, either to trade, either to preserve the resources and value that we have, uh, to have sustainability and environmental policy, to solve things like global pandemics. And unfortunately, the old systems that we have of trust regulation were through domination and hierarchies. And the entire point of the blockchain industry is saying that we can accomplish trust regulation by answering this question who is in charge by saying no one you don't need somebody in charge conceptually if something as complicated as the world financial system can run and alice and bob are able to pay each other without using an intermediate or a middleman and then suddenly you can put things like democracy and property rights and fintech and supply chains and identity uh, into this same type of a structure, then at the end of the day, we'll be our own bank. We're self-sovereign. We're in charge of our own future and uh, we'll have much better ways of interacting with the global markets with the terms and conditions up front and you'll have immutability and predictability in the way that the rules run uh, there's really no difference in saying that we'd like our money to be objective and predictable from saying we'd like our democracy and our trade regulation uh, to be objective and predictable the way we fund things to be objective and predictable uh, so this is in many reasons why people are so fanatic about Bitcoin in the blockchain industry, uh, because it isn't really about making money. It isn't really about uh, building a better business or making something more efficient or uh, making payments a little bit faster. Uh, if it was, there would certainly be a lot of people in the industry, but it would just be a job for them. Uh, this is more about answering that fundamental question of who's in charge of the 21st century. And we're left with one of two answers. Either it's going to be a transnational group of people that nobody knows much about and we didn't pick, and we just have to accept the edicts and mandates that they've made, uh, just like the totality of human history. There's always been kings and popes and uh, emperors and rulers that have done so. Or we can try something fundamentally different that's never really worked before, but we get now as a consequence of technology and the internet where we can try to build a world where no one's in charge. That's what the blockchain industry at its heart is really about. Trust regulation so that we can build systems where no one is in charge and those systems have inclusive accountability, meaning we can all verify that they're working properly, not just the trusted few. They're objective and predictable. The rules apply to everybody. The least amongst us uh, play by the same rules as the best amongst us. So the richest and poorest are the same in that respect. And they spread and propagate by their edges, not by centralized effort. Uh, there was no marketing committee to spread Bitcoin. 
Uh, there was no central authority to get Bitcoin mining power to where it's at. It went from just a few computers in 2009 to giant warehouses of miners in places like Mongolia and Georgia and so forth. Uh, and it all grew from the bottom up. It's a very different way of thinking about the world. But in many ways, it's a much more natural way uh, because ultimately it puts you in charge. So that's what Bitcoin is in a nutshell. It was an experiment. The point of the experiment was kind of two-faced. One was a passion and the other was a frustration. The passion was trying to solve a very old problem of allowing people to do business with each other without middlemen. And the frustration was doing so with principles because the principles had been violated in the past. And uh, the killer app of its, its spreading was uh, trying to create a better form of money. It's certainly debatable what is good money and it's a, a nice conversation to have, but the real value of Bitcoin, the real experiment, uh, leveraged and turned into an entire industry, uh, the blockchain industry. And that blockchain industry is about trust regulation with inclusive accountability so that we can get to a world where no one's in charge except for you for your own life. So that's uh, what is Bitcoin to me. I hope that everybody else in the industry has a uh, say in this as well and says some cool stuff about it. Uh, it really has been the privilege of a lifetime being in this industry uh, because every day I get to be a different person. Uh, some days I get to be an expert on GovTech. Other days I get to think about medical supply chains. Other days I get to think about what are the nature of privacy and property rights. Uh, some days I get to be a Wall Street guy and talk about the bank of the future. But at their heart, they're all the same in that we're just regulating trust amongst people and entities that don't really trust each other for common good without having to put anybody in charge using science, cryptography, math, these things. Uh, and these systems are global by design and by default. So thanks for listening. I hope this was helpful and uh, have a nice day. Cheers.